There's a couple of formats right now that are free that are high resolution. And the big one is FLAC, F-L-A-C, which stands for Free Lossless Audio Codec. There's another one, and that's a proprietary Apple codec. It's ALAC, Apple Lossless Audio Codec. However, the record labels actually want to use something called MQA, or Master Quality Authenticated, which is all well and good, except the problem is that you need proprietary hardware and software to play it. In one way, this is actually a good thing. Because, really, many people can't hear the difference between an MP3 and a high-resolution FLAC file, mostly because they don't have the equipment in order to take advantage of it. So, for instance, unless you're listening on a really good set of headphones and you have a player that has a great digital audio converter or DAC, then you might not hear the difference. So, one of the things MQA does bring us is the fact that you do have to at least get a good player that's going to have a good DAC in it. Apple has gone ahead and taken it a step further, actually. One of the reasons why there's no headphone jack on the new iPhones is the fact that now they're making you go to Bluetooth, and they have these new headsets and new earbuds that have high-quality DACs built in. So this is actually going to be a good thing in time. But once again, what's going to drive this is the fact that there has to be hardware in order for the software, in order for the high-res music to actually work. I think that we're going to see the floodgates open soon. Now, when is that going to be? I'd like to think it's going to be sometime in 2018. Can't say for sure. All I know is Apple has a load of high-res files in their catalog, and this is part of their Mastered for iTunes program that, of course, every record label has taken part in in the last five years. So prepare yourself for that, but let's keep our fingers crossed that people can actually hear the difference. My guest today is Brian Calhoun, who's worked on business and marketing for artists like Kanye West, Lil Wayne, The Cult, Questlove, Nicki Minaj, and Drake, among many others. He's also given workshops at industry conferences like South by Southwest, Meetem, New Music Seminar, CMJ, and over 20 more. He's also the creator of an excellent tool for artists and bands everywhere called the Music Business Toolbox. I spoke with him via Skype, where we talked about the current state of the music business. I'm always interested in people's stories about how they get into the business. So what's yours? I was uh, at the University of Georgia, and I was a finance major. Uh, I got an internship at uh, the corporate planning department at Bell South. And I think the most valuable lesson that I learned there was that I didn't want to do that for the rest of my life. <laughs> uh, it was a, it was a big music fan um, and uh, we started working with the university systems. Uh, there's an organization.
already, uh, so they knew that it was legit. <laughs> but uh, that was the that was really how I got started and had the ability to learn. And then uh, a couple of friends of mine and I, uh, a couple of my fraternity brothers, we, we were producing events for our fraternity um, on and around campus. Uh, we thought that we should uh, start producing events on our own. And uh, the three of us, uh, was, uh, Alfred, Jay, and myself, uh, we booked. We started booking national recording artists, and we started with uh, Cypress Hill, who at the time had just had their first gold album, uh, but hadn't been to Atlanta. And we were able to uh, leverage our tuition money for the next semester and put it up. And we booked them and brought them to Atlanta, and that was our first real big show. And it was great; it was a huge success. Uh, you know, going back at the you know at the time, this was in 1992. There were uh, there was. Uh, uh, 91 or 92, there was um, not uh, a lot of will uh, on behalf of uh, promoters and venues to bring the pop artists in. And so there was a bit of an opening for us because that was what we were into. And we ran it out of venue and did it. And uh, it was a great success. And we booked a number of other shows. It was funny. Our very next show was a huge disaster. We lost a ton of money after we just made a bunch of money. Uh, it was a great lesson um, that we persisted. And then uh, I, I realized that, that, that the event production, event promotion was um, was a really challenging thing if you didn't own the venue or have sponsors. And you, because if you were only making money off of ticket sales, it's, it's, a, it's a very tough business. Yeah. Uh, not making money off of the bar or, uh, you know, have some kind of corporate sponsor involved to, to cover the costs. And uh, you know, limit your risk. It's a very tough business, and uh, started. But it really, it I started developing relationships from that. I started developing relationships with the record labels who all wanted to support the shows when their artists were in town. So that was a great um, way for me to start, and uh, started doing street promotions from that because because they're like, oh, this guy kind of knows some stuff, and you know, he he can do some kind of low level grunt work promotion stuff for us, and uh, that turned into me doing that for a number of different labels uh, around the Atlanta area after I got out of college. Uh, I was also DJing and um, I was uh, DJing in Atlanta at uh, a, a community radio station and doing clubs and parties and stuff as well. <clears throat> and then leveraged that ultimately into getting a, a job doing A&R at Relativity Records a few years later uh, after a few years of kind of just, uh, you know, doing, you know, street promotions and event promotions and uh, DJ. So, uh, and then, you know, kind of from a and R, did, you know, did, you know, had some success there and, uh, moved to New York working with relativity records and went on to work at red, uh, red distribution, helped them set up the, uh, red urban music marketing division, which was a, uh, a part of the organization that helped, uh, independent, uh, urban labels kind of navigate the, uh, uh, that navigate a big distribution system, which Red was uh, and still is. Yeah. Uh, and, um, you know, it was great. Lots of hands-on experience. I was also very aggressive about trying to learn too. Uh, one of the best pieces of advice I ever got was, um, if you really want to know how a business works, follow the money <laughs> and, uh, um, and, uh, and, and take the finance guys out for lunch and take them out for drinks and, be, you know, become friends with those guys. It was Great, great piece of advice, and uh, I, I don't, I didn't realize it until much later how, how good it was. But uh, it was funny because you know I would be, the, you know, I was out with the artists and you know in the studio, and the people wanted to talk. I was like, oh, he's the A and R guy, and you know, so I kind of had uh, you know that little cachet, but I, <laughs> it wasn't, it wasn't really kind of like my world. I didn't really embrace that. I was more interested in learning about the numbers. And mm -hmm. so like, I would be happy to go and share my kind of like, you know, war stories of, you know, trying to get records delivered and crazy stuff that would happen on the road. And 